Children's Church departing. Next Sunday, there, our uh, young Mary's Sunday school class will be beginning. It's going for six weeks. Every Sunday morning, for starting next Sunday, the 15th of October at 10 a.m. in a special classroom where the young Mary's have met previously. It's going to be led by Ty and Bethany Chancellor. It's going to be a good class. Uh, I sent out some letters and some books yesterday. Uh, if you know someone who would fit into this category, a young married person, with or without children, but uh, folks around the same age group, we found that we have a, quite, a, quite a good group of those people who are in and out of here at various times. But this is a class just for them, of them, by them, and for them. So pray about that too, that, they'll, that God will use that class create some new friendships and bonds, and uh, learn some new things. Let's go on to the next slide there, Carter. Uh, also, on the 31st of this month, we're going to be asking everybody to come inside. We've been doing drive-bys for a few years. Drive-by, we've been throwing candy into the car window, but uh, it's been a while since, according to our uh, customs from days gone by, of bringing everybody in. So if you'd like to sponsor a table or have a table, we're just going to ask them to go from table to table and we'll just be giving away treats, lots of uh, scriptures, brochures and uh, documentation, and just, uh, copies of the Word of God, things like that, and things that we can contribute that have a lot to do with who He is and why we're here. So come and be a part of that, that uh, Tuesday night if you'd like to, we're just going to be doing that from 6 to 8 o'clock, just a two hour window. People, we, we have a good crowds, a good re neighborhood response to this every year. All right, let's go on. I found this uh, painting in my electronic search in preparation for this sermon. I never had seen it before, and it's very striking. And it's a, a picture of an artist uh, idea or notion of what it might have looked like when, uh, we, according to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, and Luke, chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus was driven by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, that's a strange thing right there. First of all, the, the Spirit, not only we ask the Spirit to lead, lead us, sometimes He has to drive us. <laughs> yes, yes Miss Daisy, I'll be driving. Uh, you kind of like that. The, the Spirit comes along and says, there's something I want you to do that you're not really going to enjoy much. He drove Jesus out of the wilderness, and Jesus was going to fast. And be, when we think of wilderness, or when I do, I think of going out into the woods. We always like to go see Tommy and Larry when we were kids because there were some woods behind their house. We had some woods by our house. We called them the pines. So going over into the pines, somebody had planted a huge pine thicket. And we have no idea who did it or why, but we loved running through the trees. We did that as a little, as a little boy. We, we were city boys, but we felt like we were out in the out in the country. So Jesus, the wilderness for him, however, was barren and it was a desert. And he fasted out there. And there the devil came to him and had three special temptations that were tools just for Jesus. But I want to ask the question in this message, what does the devil want? What does the devil want? I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding, and, and there's a, you might disagree with my answer to that question, but I'm going to uh, pull what I think from the Word of God today, what I think if the Scriptures teach the devil wants. Let's go on then. I want to share some Scripture with this. Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, and I really like the King James Version on this because uh, it uses a, a word that uh, I think is very striking. Here in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, starting with verse 31, the Bible says, And Jesus began to teach the twelve that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He's telling them very clearly. And uh, let me say this point here. It's just kind of a side point about Bible prophecy. The prophets of God are not gifted or talented people who have the ability to look into the future. The prophets always said, thus saith the Lord. God would tell them what he was going to do, and then he would tell the prophet, go tell people what I'm going to do. 
When God gives a prophecy, He's not looking into the future and like a, reading the stars or reading someone's palm or, or looking at a horoscope. He is saying, this is what I'm going to do in my sovereignty. This is what I'm going to do. So He's not predicting the future. He's telling you His plans. There's nothing supernatural uh, about or, uh, or mystical about prophecy in the Bible. There's not anybody that's going, Ooh, and looking into the, the days that come. No, it's not like that. The future doesn't exist anymore. God's always just there. So Jesus says, this is what's going to happen. Not because I looked into the future and saw it, <coughs> but he'd say, this is why I'm here. I'm going to be arrested, mistreated by the religious leaders. I'm going to die. And then three days later, I'm going to rise. How could it be that they would be surprised when all of this began to happen? Because it says, and Jesus began to teach the twelve, which means he didn't just spring it on them. It's something he told them, and he started telling them, and he continued telling them, because it was something he says, that's when he began telling them. And so the impression is given that he mentioned this several times. Verse 32 says, and he spoke out, and he spoke that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And he said, I will. I like one of those scenes in the, uh, in the Chosen when they are at the home of Jairus. And there is a Pharisee there, and he is just really railing on Jesus for coming into this people's home, into Jairus' home, and during a time of grief and loss and sadness, and he's just, just wearing Jesus out. And the Apostle John steps up to that person in this telling of the story and says, Do you know who you're talking to? Do you know who you're talking to, John said? You're talking to Jesus. Well, right here, Peter took Jesus, it says, and began to rebuke him. It kind of indicates, kind of grabbed hold of Jesus. And he says, oh, don't talk like that. You know, you try this sometimes. You say, well, I'm going to die someday. You know what someone in your family is going to say? Oh, don't talk like that. Don't say that. Well, you think they're not going to die? You think you're not going to die? Well, Jesus was telling them this is going to happen. You know, we're not always being pessimistic. Sometimes we're just telling what's going to happen. But when Jesus turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Now, there's a lot of questions about this. Uh, was, was Satan uh, indwelled... What, indwelling Simon Peter. Well, no. This is just a play on words, and he's, Jesus is making a point. Peter had rebuked him, and really Jesus turned around. He was talking to Peter, but it was as if he were addressing Satan. He says, get me behind me, Satan. But Peter wasn't Satan-possessed. What Jesus was saying was, if Satan were here, that's what Satan would say. I'm going to talk to you just as if I were talking to Satan. And that's what he was doing. So, no, Peter wasn't, uh, he certainly was saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. But Jesus, this was Jesus' way of saying that that's what Satan would say if he were here. Get behind me. In other words, get out of my way. Don't be standing in front of me because that's the direction I'm going. You savor not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Now, that word has to do with the mind, the word savors. He says, you think about the things, you don't think about the things of God, you're thinking about the things of men. And uh, to savor, I like that word because uh, Brian could tell you what, if he prepares a, a dish, if it's savory, that means it has flavor, it tastes good. And uh, so I like that word because that's another meaning for this word. It means you are looking for a taste in the th not in the things of God, but the things of men. You don't want uh, the things of God. You want the things of men. Let's go on to the next slide. Let me ask you some questions here in these following slides. Does the devil want to destroy, remove, or replace God? Well, I think there was a time when he did. 
The Bible seems to indicate through uh, several Old Testament passages and so th so th through some things that are taught in the New Testament that that is what happened to Satan. God created a beautiful angel named Lucifer. But then Lucifer decided that he, would, he wanted to destroy God or remove God at the very least or replace God. Well, that went terribly. That was, a, that was something that Satan wanted to do but it failed so completely and so miserably. You know, I think that Satan is an intelligent being. <laughs> I think that there is clear enough evidence throughout the whole Bible that Satan has given up on this. He's not waiting for the time to try this again. He knows that God is so powerful that this is a ridiculous thought. This is a ridiculous idea. Not making an assumption about Satan's intelligent. He might be stupid. I hope he's listening today. Or maybe I don't. But I think that Satan learned in that terrible, awful, eternal defeat that that was said and done. That was not something... I remember when I was playing football at the Hartzell Morgan County High School. And we lost to Coleman. I remember loading back up on the bus. And I had always played baseball. And we would play West Morgan or Slip Up or Summit. And then two or three weeks later, we'd play them again. They'd play on our field and we'd go play them on their field. And I remember getting on the bus and we just got beaten in a football game at Morgan County. We were at Coleman and they beat us. Now, I remember sitting down with one of my old friends there. He played the guard next to my tackle. And boy, he was tore up. He was really tore up. He was messed up, but we lost. And I, I tried to cheer him up. You know what I said? I said, we'll get him next time. And he said, there won't be no next time. We play every, every team we play this year, we play them one time. We might play them next year, but this year we'll never get a chance to beat this team that beat us tonight, we'll never see them again. There won't be no next time. That floored me. I had no idea how many games we were going to play. We were just going to play seven or eight games that whole year for our season. I think that Satan is smart enough to know not to ever try that again. It's in my belief that Satan understands and he realizes, and he's smart enough to know, that he will never, he doesn't have the power or the ability to even come close to defeating God. Okay, I, let's go on to the next slide. Does the devil want to reign in hell? Like a king, the king of hell. You know, in the uh, famous poem, Paradise Lost, John Milton quotes the devil in that story. He says, it's about the Garden of Eden story, and it's about the devil, about Adam and Eve. And the devil in that, in John Milton's Paradise Law says, I would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. And so there's an idea these days that the devil is the king of hell. No, hell is not the place where the devil is in charge. That's not his home. The book of Revelation says one of these days the devil is going to be thrown into hell on judgment day. And then the hell and the devil and all the lost are going to be cast into the lake of fire. So the devil's not in hell now. A lot of people talk about that the devil, that maybe fire is what he enjoys. Or fire is his domain. Or that fire is one of his enjoyments. I think the reason hell is made of fire is because the devil hates fire. The devil's not in hell and he's certainly not reigning there. There's no throne in hell. Hell is a place of loneliness. You're not going to be there with all your friends in hell. You're not going to be there with your family members. You're going to be in the, in the burning darkness of eternity all by yourself and separate from God. Got some funny ideas, but these are biblical ideas. Let's go on to the next question. Does the devil want to rule the earth? Does the devil want to rule the earth? I want 
to remind you, let's cast your mind back to the Great Commission in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. In the Great Commission, Jesus will say, I'm going to send you out to tell the Gospel, tell the good news to every nation. But before Jesus gave the Great Commission, He made a statement. Do you remember what it was? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's right. Jesus said, let me tell you something. All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. That's what they said before he gave the Great Commission. No, Satan is not ruling the earth. He doesn't want to rule the earth because he knows that he can't. He knows that it is and always has been Jesus' destiny to rule the earth. Jesus said, all the power of heaven and earth has been given to me. He's not going to get it someday in the millennium or at the second coming. He's not going to get it at the end of the tribulation. Jesus said, all power has been given, has been given to me. All right, let's go on to the next question. Does the devil want your soul? Well, he sold his soul to the devil. I've heard people on TikTok lately saying, well, the reason that person is a great musician or a great actor or has lots of money is because they sold their soul to the devil. Do you know there's not anything in the Bible that talks about the devil collecting souls or what the devil would do with a soul if he had it? Or if the devil bought somebody's soul, does he then have that person's soul and that person doesn't have a soul? That's all nonsense. That's nonsense. The devil doesn't buy people's soul. He doesn't collect souls. He doesn't control souls. There's not one single word in the whole word of God that says that the devil has anything to do with human souls. It's a fabrication. It's a fiction. It's, it's made up. It's nonsense. Now the devil doesn't want your soul. He's not out to get your soul. All right, let's go on. This is my favorite one. <laughs> what does the devil want? Does he want your fiddle? No, he don't want your fiddle. And he don't have a fiddle. I love this song. I love Charlie Daniels. He's with the Lord now. But Charlie was a fine Christian. Wasn't always. <laughs> that put Charlie in a bad place. He had to go back and change a lot of his songs that had cussing in it. I'm not going to sing these Christian songs since I'm a Christian. He had, and the devil went down to Georgia, he had to call the devil a son of a gun. I actually like the other version. Yeah. No, you don't want your fiddle. I just put that to say, a lot of this is just nonsense. A lot of this is just made up stuff that is not in the Bible at all. Now I want to show you something. I want to show you what I believe. And Jesus, Jesus told us what the devil wants. He doesn't want to replace God. He doesn't want to defeat God. He, he doesn't want to be the ruler of the earth. He doesn't want to rule in hell. But he is, he's very devious and he's very wicked. And he's very dark. And Jesus tells us what his strategy is. And it's very, very, very damning. It's very, very smart. And it, a lot of times it just works. What does Jesus say the devil wants? Let's go on. Look at the next slide. There's Eve. Oh, she's pretty, wasn't she? I guess she was. This is just an artist saying, that's probably what Eve looked like. Maybe it's what Eve looked like. But I've seen that look in a woman's eyes. I sure have. So every once in a while, I've seen that look in a woman when she's been looking at me. Not so much anymore. <laughs> Remember when you, the love of your life walking through me and just went, <sighs> Now she walks in the room and you say, What? What? What do you want me to do? What do you want? What are you going to say? I saw a meme the other day. It said a woman was talking to her husband and she said, You haven't been listening to a word I said, have you? 
And he was thinking, what a strange way to start a conversation. <laughs> I'll be, I, I'll tell you this, Terry knows. We we'll drive along, we might drive along for three or four or five hours going somewhere. We did that recently. And suddenly I look over and there's a voice in my mind that says, you know, she's been talking for a long time. I wonder what she said. <laughs> what time are we supposed to be there? What does your wife say? I already told you. I already told you. I told you five times. <laughs> We've been married so long, I look at her right now and say, "Hun, what you just said is very important. And I, thought, I know you think I'm going to remember it, but I'm not. If you'll send that to me in a text, there's a really good chance that I might actually remember it. But maybe not. Look at Eve right there. She's got her eyes on something. Can you see what's up right above her head right there? That's the serpent. That's the serpent. Now the Bible never says that that's the devil. It just says he's a serpent. Now he's pretty sure working for the devil or he was contracted out by the devil. Or just on the devil's side, I don't know. Might have been the devil in a serpent form. The serpent didn't say, we need to get God. We need to do something to hurt God. We need to attack God. No. Do you know what the serpent wanted Eve to have? What did he want from Eve? What did he want Eve to have? <clears throat> he wanted her to have an apple. Mm-hmm. Which was pretty convenient because that's exactly what she wanted. He said, he said, boy, you, did God say you couldn't eat this? And, uh, and she said, yeah, God, God said we couldn't eat it. She said, God said, don't even touch it. Well, God didn't say that. She was trying to be extra careful. And then, then he knew he had her because she wanted that apple. And he wanted her to have that apple. All right, let's go on. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness and for 40 days, it says after 40 days, Satan came to him. Now that's a, that's a stack of rocks right there. After 40 days of not eating anything, what do you imagine that the humanity of Jesus wanted? What do you think he wanted? Food. Something to eat. Something to eat. And the devil said, look right there. There are, there's some stones. You could, just, you could have some bread here just by speaking the word. There are actually three temptations. And all three of them represent something that Jesus wanted. And the devil was there, and he was really saying, all I want, I'm not against God. I really like God. I'm not mean and ugly. I'm not a devil. But I'm just here because all in the world I want is what you want. And he, he, the devil was quoting the Bible to him and saying, see here, all I want, Jesus, is what you want. Let's go on to the next slide. Look at Jesus' words here. This is from the passage that we read in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8. Get behind me, Satan. You do not want what God wants. Let's look at the next slide. You want what men want. That's pretty tricky. You see, there is a myth out there that's probably inspired by the devil too. The devil just wants to kill everybody. The devil just wants to torture everybody. The devil wants their soul. The devil is evil and mean and, and he just wants to cause grief and pain. What if the devil showed up at your house and said, well, I'm here, we're going to wrestle. We're going to fight. 
we're going to, I'm, I'm going to cause you all kinds of pain and misery. Well, you'd bow up and you'd say, okay, I don't like that, but here we go, let's do it. That's not the way he works at all. That's not even close. Look on the next slide. The devil wants what you want. The devil wants what you want. And he wants what I want. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, because you don't want the things of God. You want the things of men. Jesus said, I'm going to be crucified. They're going to kill me. Well, Simon Peter didn't want that. But the reason Jesus was telling them that he was going to be arrested and crucified is because it was what God wanted for his life. But Simon Peter loved Jesus, and he didn't want Jesus to die. And when he took Jesus and began to rebuke him for talking like that, that's when Jesus said this. You're just like the devil. The devil doesn't want what God wants. He wants, Peter, what you want. When you face all of life's temptations, when you're tempted, you're going to find, if you have not already, that there you have a cheerleader, that you have someone who's always for you. Someone who's always on your side. Someone who's always standing beside you says, if you want that car, you ought to just get it. If you want that job, you ought to just take that job. If you want to go to that place, if that's what you'd enjoy, then I'm behind you every step of the way. You're always going to have someone who wants exactly what you want. You know why? Because what I want, because of what I want, is hardly ever, hardly ever what God wants for me. You know what? God tells me no a lot of times. He's a very good parent. God says, you can't go here, you can't do this, you can't do that. In the very next passage, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says this, all right. If you're going to follow me, you got to do these two things. You know what the first one was? Deny yourself. You've got to deny yourself. If you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to be a Jesus follower, the first thing you've got to do is deny yourself. What do you know what that means? You've got to be able to say no to yourself. Because yourself is what got you into this place in the first place. Yourself is what makes you lost. Yourself is what makes you a child of the devil. Yourself is not what makes you a child of God. If you're going to follow me, Jesus says, you've got to learn how to say no to you and yes to God. No to yourself and yes to God. The devil is going to all the... If you ever have an idea of something you want to do, the devil is always going to want the same thing you want. I can't go around in life just doing what I want to do. I can't follow my heart. Isaiah said the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? The writer of Proverbs says, There is a way that seemeth right in a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You can't go through your daily life making up your mind according to what you'd like to do. It's just too easy because every time you look at something and say, well, I'd like that, the devil's going to step up right behind you and say, yeah, that'd be a great idea. I'm with you. I'm on this. I'm behind you 100%. I'm on your side. Yes, you can have it. You can do it. You can go there. Let's look at the next slide. have an apple. You know you want it. It's beautiful. It'd probably make you wise. 
And it'll make you, actually it'll make you like God. Go ahead. You and I are to spend our lives trying to find out, to seek what God wants. Find out what God wants. What is God's will? You're always going to know with absolute certainty what you want to do. What you want. You're always going to, it's going to be easy to figure out what you want. You know what makes it easier? The devil's already going, always going to come in and say, go ahead. Yeah, have an apple. Make some bread. Whatever you want to do, I'm with you all the way. We have to labor and disciple ourselves. We have to pray and seek because I know that I can't trust me. I can only trust Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. You don't need that cheerleader and you don't need to be listening to that racket because he just wants you to eat the apple. That's all. And that's his way. Let me tell you what. That's the only way. That's the only way that he can hurt God. Because he loves you so much. Father, if there's someone here today and they're doing what they want to do and they're following their life's path and they're making their own choices, they're living their life the way they want to, they're whatever feels good, they're doing it, I pray that you would save them. Deliver them from that voice that always wants them to choose wrong. Father, if there's anybody here today who isn't struggling and isn't facing battles, but is just saying yes to the devil at every turn, I pray that you deliver them and bring them into the fight. Teach them to trust you and you alone and not themselves. For I ask it, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.